American policy makes no sense to the rest of the world because it's not supposed to. Because you're thinking like the people who are in charge are actually working for the United States. They are not. They are working to destroy it. Period. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Diera, part of the outreach team of Silver Bullion here in Singapore, where we want to help you truly secure your wealth. Tom Luongo joins us today. Tom is a former research chemist turned geopolitical and market analyst. He is publisher of the Gold, Golds, and Guns newsletter and blog. And Tom sifts out the stories from behind the headlines and weaves the disparate threads of the global macro environment into a coherent picture. He backs that up with a strong track record of making actionable calls on markets with uncommon accuracy. And we're delighted to have Tom join us here as a first-time guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Tom Luongo. Tom, welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm good this morning, Patrick. Thank you for the invite. Thank you for coming on. Really do appreciate it. I've seen some of your work, actually a lot of your work, and um, it's definitely a step above, a cut above a lot of other things out there. So I appreciate the the time that you put into it. Tom, since you are a first-time guest, I'd like to ask if you don't mind telling us a bit about yourself. Sure. Um, where to start? I started as a chemist uh, at the beginning of my career coming out of college, and I, I spent 25 years as a bench and research chemist. And uh, when that career ended in my early 40s, I, I started monetizing my hobby, and I started working with a guy over in Vietnam, as a matter of fact. I, this is probably um, maybe germane, a little bit germane to this this this, this conversation today, because I know you guys are out of Singapore. And, um, I studied Southeast Asia with him for about two and a half, three years, and learned how to to, he taught me a lot. He was a broker. and I, I learned a lot about the, the guts of capital markets, how to read a balance sheet and stuff like that. Eventually, I wound up, I was always a gold guy and a kind of a you know standard Austro-Libertarian. I got hired by Newsmax in 2013 to write a gold newsletter. And then it's just kind of, and I have, I've had two stints with Newsmax. Um, and in the, in the interim between, between them, I started Gold, Goats, and Guns, which is my the current project. I'm still with Newsmax as well. I write a different newsletter for them today, Ultimate Wealth Report. And um you know, gold, goats, and guns was a way to make ends meet in the interregnum, basically, and it's kind of taken off from there. I just think it's amazing how you make that that huge leap from from being a chemist to to where you are today. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, it's not really that much of a leap because you you, you and it's an interesting part about it. It's like, I, I've talked with Dave Collum about this many, many times, and I don't like the name drop, but and I love talking with Dave because we're both chemists, right? Uh, we're both investors, and we both like making money, and you know, the all of that stuff, right? But we have, but we have a, you know, we, we both kind of have a, identified, we have a little bit of a superpower, which is that we're never married to a hypothesis, right? Because, you know, science teaches you one thing, which is that you're going to fail 99% of the time. And that most of the ideas that you put up on paper aren't going to work. And so you learn through failure and you learn to suppress your ego and you learn to be, you know, no matter how big your ego actually is. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I don't have a big ego and I like it when my hypotheses fail, but you learn to say, okay, um, yeah, no, that didn't work. And then you move on and you go, and then you have to lick your wounds and, and learn from your, your past mistakes and then fine tune the process. And I think that that's something that's, I know it's kind of sorely lacking and especially in the financial com- commentary app, because we're all taught as marketers to like show strength. And it's kind of the same stuff they tell politicians, you know, never back down, always show strength, always project that you're in control, stick chest out, all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, that doesn't really, that, that that's not a good long term strategy if you're if you're dealing with capital markets and you're wrong at least forty percent of the time, right? I mean the good ones are only right sixty percent of the time or sixty five percent of the time, and you're so you're going to be wrong one out of three guesses. Like, dude, that that's a high failure rate when you're talking about marketing. So. I've just always come to the conclusion that the best way to to go about doing this is just you know put stuff out there start the conversations that people aren't having and then see where the things lead you. And sometimes you're, you're right. And sometimes you're very wrong. And, and then you, you, know, you live with it and you move on. I want to start off with uh, Janet Yellen. She, Tom, what, what kind of, what kind of grade would you give her as treasury secretary thus far? And I want you to consider 
She and George William Miller, I believe, are the only two people to serve as Fed chairman and Treasury secretary. And with George William Miller, well, he, he served in the Carter administration, and we all know what happened back then with inflation back in the late 70s. So um, what kind of grade would you give Miss Yellen so far? Well, if I could go lower than F, I would. So F minus? Um, I, I, I fundamentally believe that Yellen it, it works for a different cabal than Jerome Powell. Like she was a different Fed chairman than Jerome Powell. I think Yellen is a committed globalist. I, I personally, I think she's a communist. Um, but that's a that that may be inflammatory rhetoric outside of the bounds of quote unquote financial markets. But the truth of the matter is, is that she's a labor economist out of the San Francisco Fed tradition. Which is another, in my mind, my mind, especially from an Austro-Libertarian perspective, is just a euphemism for communist. And every time she makes a move, and every time she makes a statement anymore, that statement is in service of putting the United States still at the global center of the responsibility of taking care of the global capital markets, as opposed to taking care of the United States. And if you listen to Jerome Powell talk, Jerome Powell talks about things in sovereignist terms. He always talks about the dual mandate. Now, he's lying a little bit when he says this, but he always hides behind the dual mandate of full employment and stable prices. That's the Federal Reserve's mandate as mitigate, as you know, as promulgated by Congress, demanded by Congress, and then crafts Fed policy based on that. Well, Yellen at every turn tries to undermine him. She's doing yield curve control now by issuing short-term, a ton of short-term treasuries as opposed to uh, issuing sevens, tens, and thirties when the yield curve is inverted, and there's clearly demand, and you know she could sell into that supply at you know ninety basis points lower than you could a three month, and yet she's not doing so. And why? Is she, so then you have to ask the question: Why is she doing that? Well, it's very clear why she's doing that because she's trying to save the bacon of her uh, of her you know communist and crime over in Europe, Christine Lagarde at the ECB, who is clearly running. And a yield curve control policy across the entire Eurozone that makes what the Jet Bank of Japan's done for the last 30 years look like an Amish barn raising. Like, it's crazy. If you watch, if you look at German 10 years, French 10 years, Portuguese 10 years, uh, Spanish 10 years, Dutch 10 years, it doesn't matter. There's a line drawn in the sand over the last nine months that's only just recently broken, or the last year, that, that Lagarde has desperately tried to hold on to. And every time... She every time she loses starts to lose control of the European bond market, Yellen steps in to do something on the world stage to try and bring um bond yields in on the long end of the curve back under control, keep the 210 spread on the American markets uh, inversion wide in order to keep telling um normie bond traders that the United States is headed for the world's worst recession. Meanwhile, Europe is literally sinking into a depression. Its, its industrial leader, Germany, is deindustrializing at a rate that we haven't seen in modern times. And I, I have to wonder how anybody could think that Yellen works for the United States. So from that perspective, and you know, while I have a lot of criticisms of my government, and I have a lot of criticisms of the way we conduct foreign policy, fiscal policy, monetary policy, regulatory policy, and everything else, I'm still patriot. I still don't want to see the United States like purposefully hollowed out by a bunch of vandals in the Biden administration. And Yellen, as Yellen's um, uh, uh, record as both head of the San Francisco Fed, who helped create the the the, the current monstrosity that is uh, Silicon Valley, and then as Fed chairman, which helped keep the ECB solvent for ten years under ZERP and NERP. Um, it's, she's just, she's just extending that same process as treasury secretary. She comes out this morning, literally, and says, oh, we can afford to fight two wars. Are you like, I, I don't know. Are you still having a, a mushroom hangover from your, your trip to Beijing where you beg manded the, uh, the Chinese to buy treasuries to keep the, to, to save the ECB? Because that's what happened. And you can see it in the TIC report, the American TIC report from July, well, published in September for July, where Hong Kong, um, out of nowhere, bought $18.7 billion worth of U.S. treasuries. China didn't, but Hong Kong did. So that's how that worked. And like, like I, I watch this, this stuff every day, Patrick, and I have a very unique view of the markets because I just assume that, and I don't, again, this is not about my ego or anything. I, I purposefully took a particular path 
to analyze markets because my base assumption was they're all vandals and they're all trying to kill us. And then I then ran that hypothesis and I come up a winner every time. And it's not a particularly hard hypothesis to run if you're just willing to dispense with all of the bromides about how you think capital markets work and you dispense with the idea that we actually have capital markets. <laughs> because we live in a central bank dominated world where, where, where capital markets, the, the, imp the impetuses, the normal imperatives in the capital markets have been so thoroughly suppressed that when we see someone like Jerome Powell, which I'm sure you're going to ask me about next, actually say, you know what? Hey, let's normalize monetary policy. Let's let the free market price start to price risk. Everybody's freaking out because they don't know how to deal with this. Because we've all become Keynesians. We've all become commies in that respect. Like, we don't have real capital markets. So we're supposed to trade the third derivative of the impulse of monetary policy by saying, well, good news is bad news is good news is bad news, so therefore we should do this. Right? And that's where we are today. And how about, no, bad news is just bad news. You know, he's raising rates. If you're enjoying this interview with Tom Luongo and I, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. And did you know that at Silver Bullion here in Singapore, you can collateralize your precious metals in storage and take out a bullion secured peer-to-peer -peer loan while retaining full ownership of your metals. For more info, go to www.silverbullion.com.sg, go to the P2P Loan tab and click on About. I guess you kind of answered my, my next question. I was going to ask you if, if you think Janet Yellen is on point with her policies and sentiment towards the general public, because it, it, it really does, uh, you can see quite a bit of, of cracks there. And um, I guess you kind of answered that. So I, I want to touch on something else she said that um, it recently came out, is reported that uh, Janet Yellen said the U.S. can absolutely, absolutely, afford to financially support both Israel and Ukraine in their respective war efforts. Now, politics aside, and the key word here being the U.S. can absolutely afford financial support, how does a country 30 plus trillion in debt, not even counting unfunded liabilities, absolutely afford financial support anywhere at this point? And 109% debt to GDP ratio on a $2 trillion budget deficit that she's desperately trying to mask through um, bill, mass, uh, unbelievable bill issuance and whatnot, unless she just thinks war is cheap. And she un fundamentally thinks that, you know, we're, we, we're just going to go back to the zero bound and then we do away with the central. Because remember, Daniel DiMartino Booth makes this point all the time that when the Fed's at the zero bound, they're not a central bank. Right. And um, I agree with her completely. Um, and I, you know, I like to give credit where credit is due. I'm not name dropping here. I'm just, I'm trying to make sure that when ideas out, you know, uh, when ideas originate outside myself, that I give credit to where I heard it from, because I think it's very important. I don't think we do enough of that in the financial, uh, com commentary at space. Um, so Danielle's point about that is absolutely correct. We have to have, a, if, if we're going to have a central bank, if we're going to have, you know, then we might as well have one that actually works for the United States. And, and Yellen is insane in thinking that we can, um, we can afford both wars. So, of course, what does she? What does that mean? Well, what it means is that she's a mouthpiece for other powers. She's a mouthpiece for. Look, I firmly believe that the United States and Europe are at war with one another at the oligarch level, at the forty thousand foot. Who's going to control the world level, right? Because it's clearly what's happening now is as the old financial system breaks, which it's breaking, and everybody knows that. Then, as that system breaks. You have to ask yourself, okay, well, who's going to try and be the last person standing as the thing breaks? Like, it's a big, giant Ponzi scheme, and, you know, it's a race to the bottom to see who's going to control the most amount of capital and at the end, when, when everything's a smoking ruin, to then start the rebuild. And then they'll be the ones that have the power. So, you know, go back to World War II. We were the only economy that wasn't bombed back to the Stone Age, and therefore we were the one that was going to be the one that led the world out of the horror of World War II simply because our industrial base hadn't been bombed, okay? I mean, yes, you could argue we were mostly free markets and blah, blah, blah. We could all argue all, of those, all, all those other ancillary points.
But the reality is, is that Britain wasn't going to do it. France wasn't going to do it. Germany wasn't going to do it. The Russians weren't going to do it. Bob, you know, who was going to do it? There was no China. There was no modern China. It had to be the United States. Well, in this scenario, if you, if you think through that framework, if you exist in, if you, if you use that as your boundary condition to solve the problem of everybody's incentives, then it's clear that someone is or some ones are working to say, we don't want the United States to run the world after this whole collapses. So how do we destroy the United States? These are very simple questions that if you're drawing this stuff up on the whiteboard at Oligarch Central, this is what you do. You put up a SWOT analysis of the United States and you go, what are the threats? What are the weaknesses? And how do you, and how do you break the United States? Well, you break it culturally, politically, economically, and you get it involved in wars it cannot fight, and you continue it on the path of fiscal and monetary irresponsibility that have brought down every other empire in history, right? That's how you do it. And the truth of the matter is, is that our greatest allies are actually our greatest enemies. Our greatest enemies are not Russia and China. Those people are absolutely willing to cut a deal and split the world up into regional powers and China has its area of influence, the Russians have theirs, and we have ours, and, you know, everybody can start fighting over Africa and South America, or, oh my God, let them actually develop on their own. That's always possible. It's the old colonialist powers of Europe that have run the world for five or 600 years that fir firmly believe they still have the right to do so. And you hear it in the rhetoric of the people who run the European Union. Joseph Burrell, the foreign, the, the foreign minister of the EU, calling the EU a garden and the rest of the world a jungle. Okay? If there's not a, if that's not illuminating of a mindset, okay, then I don't know what is. Because Burrell clearly, you know, gave the script away when he said that, right? And it wasn't that, yeah, I, I, you could be generous and say, well, he meant that we have to protect the jewel that is the European Union and Europe and European culture. Fine. But then to characterize the rest of the world as an uncivilized jungle is betraying of a mindset. And that mindset and that arrogance and that self-righteousness suffuses every bit of EU policy and every bit of, and then there's the Brits behind them, you know, fomenting conflicts in in all the remnants uh, of where they left conflicts all across the, the British, the, as they pulled back the British Empire. And you see it in all of the geopolitical conflicts uh, in the world today. And because of that, that's what actually informs the movements of our capital markets. That's what informs the decisions, the insane decisions of some of our leadership. It's And once you see it that way, you can't unsee it. And that's why we are where we are. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> couldn't agree with couldn't agree more with just about everything you said there, uh, especially the part about how globalization is it's fading back into regionalization, and the world is going to be carved up into new regions, and there is going to be a uh, so-called leader in each of those mm -hmm. regions. I want to get back to to Yellen. Um, she's going to try and shape the yield curve. But what's your take on this? I mean, isn't shaping a yield curve usually done mm -hmm. by a central bank, not a treasury secretary? Yeah. Yes. That's how desperate they are. What they're trying to do is run out the clock on Jerome Powell. It's very clear that what they're hoping to do is to uh, extend and pretend for as long as possible, pull, uh, stave off a sovereign debt crisis in Europe as long as possible using U.S. fiscal policy as the means by which to keep the system, the overseas markets liquefied. You do that through ruinous fiscal policy, sending all these dollars out overseas. Powell, by raising interest rates very quickly, has destroyed the leverage that was used to, to make those offshore markets orders of magnitude bigger, the so-called shadow banking system, orders of magnitude bigger than the, than the traditional banking system. So how do you, how do you reverse that process? Well, you raise interest rates. You raise the cost of dollars. How do you do that without the United States, uh, implo the United States banking system imploding? Um, you get us off of LIBOR so that when the offshore dollar banks start to implode, when their balance sheets are hollowed out and the dollar starts to go through a massive bull wave, American markets are insulated from that because they have their own debt in 
debt indexing rate as opposed to using London's debt indexing rate. Now, all of a sudden, American foreign, uh, American monetary policy doesn't work for the city of London. It works for the 12 regional Fed banks. It works for the regional, it works for the commercial banking system of the United States. That's why the split between SOFR and LIBOR is so important. And anybody who dismisses that, as far as I'm concerned, whether they believe, whether they understand this or not, are working for the old colonial powers of Europe, even if they're not doing so consciously. I'm not accusing anybody of being an agent, but sometimes it's really hard to distinguish between those carrying water for these people and those people actively act, actively act, acting as propagandists on Twitter and bots on Twitter. And you can see it clearly. And as far as I'm concerned, the stakes are too high for us to sit here and suffer people who refuse to accept reality at this point. And this is why I don't mind being firm and being a bit of a, you know, and being a bit of a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I don't know, fart in the wind. Like, I don't mind putting people, I don't mind putting people on notice about this because it's incredibly important to understand this point because once you understand that, you can understand why Powell raises the five and a half percent and nothing's broken yet. Things are breaking, but nothing's broken. Whereas everybody told us two years ago that if Powell goes to 1%, he'll have to go back to the zero bound. Interesting. Didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Sofer, not LIBOR. Over and over and over again. The U.S., he built a $2.5 trillion war chest and uh, liquidity sink in the reverse repo facility, which is being rapidly drained and is now down to $1.1 trillion and is rapidly being depleted, which is probably the countdown timer on when he's going to have to start cutting rates, right? But the question then is, is everybody else, you know, running out of money faster? And then we can get into the Bank of Japan, the Swiss National Bank, and all these other people who have been running interference for Lagarde and the ECB and the amount of money that, um, frankly, the Eurozone's been buying, has been the biggest buyer of U.S. Treasuries for the past year and a half. Over almost $500 billion, according to the TIC report, from the time Powell's uh, started, started, uh, since June of 21, when Powell raised the reverse repo payout five basis points above the Fed funds rate, from that moment forward, the European, the, the, the Euro Europe and its satellites have bought over $500 billion or roughly of U.S. treasuries for their central bank reserves. Meanwhile, Asia Pacific has dumped over 400. So the, the, the Japanese and the Chinese, for the most part, have dumped that number of treasuries. And this is why the yield curve in the U.S. looks the way it does. Now, at some point, you know, and by the way, who's, the, who's been the biggest one recently? It's been the Bank of England. Who doesn't have any money? <laughs> like, they don't have any gold, they don't have any collateral, they don't have nothing. And yet the BOE, and yet the BOE is out there buying tons of treasuries, um, replacing Japan, not replacing Japan, but rising up those, you know, the, and they're desperately trying to hold, you know, long, the long end of the U.S. yield curve down, because then that has, you know, knock-on effects to everybody else as bond traders go, how is Germany trading at 2% less than, than the United States when they don't have an economy? And oil's at $90 a barrel. And inflation's running at 9% or whatever it is, right? You know, and, and, and eventually those illusions about what been go, you know, what's going on and the market signals that they keep getting from the interventions from these, these, these central banks, eventually they break down. Eventually the bond vigilantes realize, oh no, Powell has our backs and we're going to go higher. And we can, we can press our advantage. And they're doing so, and they've been doing so for about the last three months. Um, and it's been very interesting. And I called for the return of the bond vigilantes in October. And it started in mid-September. And it's, um, it's, it's caused political unrest in the United States. We have no Speaker of the House. It's caused all sorts of problems. Um, and, it's a, and frankly, it's a very good thing. Because we have to change the path that the United States is on. Or there's not going to be a United States. And, you know, one of the things that I, I last, last point, I'll turn the mic back over that I want people to understand is the following, that in the grand scheme of things, how you be, how you, be, how you, how they win this fight is to break the U.S. bond market. How do you break the U.S. bond market? Politically make the United States untenable. Promote secession, promote division between red states and blue states, promote Democrats and Republicans refusing to speak to each other on Capitol Hill, promote division. And then all that something has to happen is we have a replay of, you know, Fort Sumter 
which, by the way, the British and the French helped, you know, foment Southern secession all through the 1840s and 1850s. You run this scenario again, and then what happens to the U.S. debt? What happens if Florida and Texas fi- finally decide to say, I haven't had enough of New York and California? Or flip the script, what if New York and California say, I've had enough of Florida and Texas? What happens to the bond market in the United States? Who's on, 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 the, on tap for that $33 trillion in debt? And who ben- who's going to benefit from the capital flight from that kind of, that kind of um, uh, chaos? Well, clearly Europe. Clearly China. So what do we have to do? Not let that happen. And not be gaslit by morons who are trying to kill us and destroy us. And so when you see it strategically that way, now you can, like, the rest of the capital markets to me just make perfect sense. That's what, and, and what would sovereigntists within the United States do as a response to that? And who would they back on Capitol Hill? What policies would they, would they back? Blah, blah, blah. What would you see in the political realm? And, you know, then we get Mac Gates taking down Kevin McCarthy. It's almost as predictable as the day is long. Right. In regarding your, uh, <clears throat> your comments about like a, like a fart in the mm-hmm. wind, <clears throat> my uncle <laughs> used to tell me, there's only two kind of people in this world, the fart maker and the fart smeller. So uh, <laughs> I guess you're, uh, you're, you're doing okay there. Yeah, I, I I don't mind. I, I I don't know how we got down that rabbit hole, but I was trying not I was trying not to use you know foul language, so I wound up with that one, and here we are having this conversation. That's 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 hilarious. I, oh my god! Um, but yeah, I I don't mind I don't mind being the guy letting one rip on Twitter like every day. It's not it's not a problem. <laughs> well, I will try my best to 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 walk parallel with you. So uh, you know, Tom, being being in Asia, I I personally really get the vibe that the whole U.S. government is, is scrambling to show a sign of intellectual prowess. I mean, Yellen is, is no different in that she seems to, to want to send a message to the world, and maybe in particular, in particular, maybe to China to say that things are okay, we're working on it, and, uh, you know, but maybe this is perhaps to slow down the, the selling of debt, uh, de-dollarization, the rise of the BRICS, or, or whatever it may be. How do you think Yellen and the U.S., can address his growing national debt and budget deficit? Or, or is it just a, a totally different agenda in play here? Well, I think Yellen is not the one fighting for that system to survive. I think she's the one actively undermining it. Now, when you start talking about Powell, that's a different story. I think Powell's a sovereigntist, and I think, Jen, I think Yellen's the globalist. Um, Yellen is doing everything imaginable to say, no, no, we can afford it all. Like we can, we can guns and butter and every, and everything else that you could possibly imagine. And, you know, we can go back to 260% jet debt to GDP like we had during World War II and we can, we can do this. Like, no, we can't. Um, the world can't afford this and the world's a debt saturation has been a debt saturation for an awfully long time. The reason why we're not at the zero bound anymore is for these reasons. So, um, Yellen wants the end of the commercial banking system. Clearly, she wants the central banks to run everything. That's what she's. That's that's the net effect of putting these policies in place. But how can we get out of it? Well, we can. There's many ways of doing it. I don't know that we have time to, to cover that today. The important thing to understand is the first thing you have to do is raise interest rates off the zero bound, get people thinking, you know, sincerely about what debt they're going to take on, if they're going to take on any debt, and how they're going to clean up their personal balance sheets as well as the, as well as the balance sheet of the country. When we under Volcker, we had the balance sheet room to do what ha- what we did. The argument that people like Luke Roman and others make, right, and fair point to, to Luke and the rest of them, that we don't have the balance sheet room to do to do that. I'm like, well, that's why Powell's desperately trying to bring the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve down. And we're trying to, and we're, and he's saying quite explicitly to the banks, you need to raise capital. We're not going to bail you out. And, uh, you're, some of you are going to go under. And, you know, it was interesting. I, I saw a, a note from Bloomberg the other day. I just saw this morning that, you know, just before J.P. Morgan, it was written before J.P. Morgan's earnings report. And I find J.P. Morgan to be the, the pivot of the, all the ma- major money center banks in New York. And that they, they and I want to say it was BOFA, but maybe I'm wrong about that. It was definitely Morgan saying, oh, we're having to take, we're having to write down a whole bunch of bad debt. Like, this is not five, six, seven billion dollars worth of bad debt right before earnings. And then earnings come out and they have blowout earnings with record high net interest margin. 
And everybody's like, see, oh, Morgan, they steal all these banks and then they, you know, pro no, you missed the point. Record net interest margin, record 363 traditional banking, you know, borrow at three, lend at six, you're on the golf course by three, as Caitlin Long said to me the other day and the podcast we did together was great. Like net interest margin is, is traditional banking. Make a loan, make a profit on it, distribute the profit to the, to, to the shareholders, you know, bankers' hours are nine to three, and there's a reason for that. Like, it's right there in front of you. Liquidate bad debt, allow for the return of high return proper debt in this environment where, yeah, the Fed funds rates at five and a half or five and a quarter, five and a, you know, between five and a quarter and five and a half, you know, that's the current target range. Great. But this clearly good loans that can be made at current rates, just not the loans that everybody has been used to getting. So no, you're not going to get a car loan at 2% unless it's directly from the manufacturer who's basically just cutting the price on a car he can't sell. That's all he's doing. Because he was planning on making the money back up on, in, in, uh, he's planning on making the money back up in the financing rates on the car, on the, the finance charges on the car. So if you, for example, you buy a car at, three grand under MSRP or five grand under MSRP, but you finance it at 7% for six years, you're going to pay $10,000 in finance charges on the loan, right? But depending on the size of the loan. And at, you know, average transaction cost now, say $48,000, $50,000 for a car. Well, there you go. There's, they actually haven't cut the price of the car at all. What they've done is they've actually raised the price of the car by five, by five grand, but they just said, we'll take it over 72 months as opposed to at point of sale over a 0% loan. Like that's what they've done. So the car companies haven't gotten real yet. They're getting close. You know, the mortgage lenders haven't gotten real yet. They're getting close. Commercial, commercial real estate guys are, are refusing to sell at, you know, distressed properties at 30, at 30 cents under par. You know, and, the, and the insurance companies and the pension funds who would love to buy all this commercial real estate when it gets to 50% off, because then they can... And then they can turn a 4% commercial real estate loan at par into an 8%, you know, an 8% income stream at 50% off. And then all of a sudden that fits within their, um, their cap table and they like it. And then they don't want that loan to fail. They're going to figure out how to get more people into the, into those buildings at cheaper rents. Rents will come down, but their margins will go up, but it has to be at rational, but someone has to take the haircut. And so far, we haven't seen the haircuts in the commercial real estate industry. China's going through the same thing, but they've got, um, you know, they've got state support of their banking system. Fine, whatever. It's going to be all, but there's going to be a whole lot of people in China that used to be billionaires that are going to be persona, you know, going to be, you know, sir, not appearing in this next bull market because they're going to, you know, be at the work camps. Like, and that's just the way it's going to work. China's just going to get rid of these people. We don't do that. We're going to, you know, make, we're, we have to bankrupt them. And Yellen doesn't want to bankrupt them. We want to keep the stuff and extend and pretend for as long as possible and then collapse it when it's, when it's maximally destructive for the United States. And I, I, I want to make this point over and over and over again. American policy makes no sense to the rest of the world because it's not supposed to. Because you're thinking like the people who are in charge are actually working for the United States. They are not. They are working to destroy it. Period. Okay? And if the Powell wing of the, if the, Powell wing of the American political... Uh, power structure wins, y'all are going to have to deal with the fact that we're not coming back down to ever going back to the zero bound and there will never be any more QE. And emerging markets are going to take the brunt of this and, and developing markets are going to take the brunt of this, at least in the short term. So again, this is why Russia and China are filling into that, are trying to fill into that, uh, that vacuum to provide alternative sources of funding and de-dollarization and all those other things. And Powell understands that and says, okay, great. You're going to de-dollarize? We're going to, you know, take the dollars and bring them back home. All right. That's another great point there. Uh, Tom, I'm, I'm going to throttle down a little bit here. Um, you know, with all these things that, that we've been talking about, I want to ask you, given the global shaking going on right now with wars, rumors of wars, currency shifts, geopolitical influences changing, and, and of course, things like financial and, and economic pain, where does an investor go? I mean, gold, Bitcoin, both. I mean, where where is a safe place right now for for wealth protection? And and nothing here is financial advice. 
Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. This is the this is the money shot, right? The money shot here is that we're going to see, as Martin Armstrong has pointed out for years, we're going to see a shift from debt into tangible assets. And so, for investors, you know, just having your money go to ground and putting it in cash, i.e., the dollar, gold, Bitcoin, which are all just cash equivalents, to a lesser extent, silver. Um, I view silver mostly as an industrial metal at this point, not a not a not a monetary metal, but in times of stress and when it's really really cheap relative to gold, it does uh, acquire monetary character briefly. But until I see a central bank start accumulating silver for reserve purposes, I don't consider silver a monetary metal. Just don't. And I think that that's a if you keep your expectations on silver rooted in that, then your silver then you will watch silver's performance and it'll make more sense to you and it'll de-stress the way you should view your silver holdings. Um, what I recommend to people all the time is just play the gold silver ratio, um, and uh, and and you know when it's it's in silver's favor buy silver when it's in gold's favor buy gold. It's not that tough. Um, more of one than the other, but I always recommend you buy both at the same time. Just bias. You're you're buying like seventy five twenty five when one is cheap relative to the other one. That's all, right? So you buy seventy. So with, you know, if you have a thousand dollars, put in gold silver. But when when the the ratio is uh, in gold's favor, you buy seven hundred and fifty dollars worth of gold and two hundred and fifty bucks worth of silver. When it's in silver's favor, you buy seven hundred and fifty dollars worth of silver and buy two hundred and fifty dollars worth of gold. You do it that way. Um, Bitcoin, absolutely. Since we're coming up on a, a halving next year, um, Bitcoin is still in a bear market, and it's uh, from a uh, from a long term perspective. It actually threw for the first time in its history a one bar um, bearish reversal signal in twenty twenty two. Um, its price action in 2023 has not reversed that. So you have to consider that Bitcoin is going to continue to be in a bear market until that changes. I think it will be a good thing for Bitcoin to go through a multi-year bear market um, in order to, while it, you know, it fights against the Fed that is actually trying to defend itself against, you know, defend itself as opposed to committing ritualistic suicide. I mean, this is one of the ideas that we have to like, like promulgate here is like, think about Bitcoin in the in you know, in this first 13 years, it was working. It, it was building um, a market share. Excuse me, um, while the Fed was literally trying to commit suicide at the zero bound and QE and all this other stuff. And now the Fed is actually acting as if it wants to survive. Right, Bitcoin's never operated in that environment before, so you should expect it to be. It to act differently. I don't know how differently, but it's going to act differently. That doesn't mean that it's like, I think it's under, I think it's overvalued at $28,000 a coin. I think it's vastly undervalued at that price. But at the same time, once you understand that there's a shift to tangible assets underway, then you have to start looking for income streams off of those tangible assets. And that gets harder for investors, right? Then you have to start looking at, you can't look at miners per se, because miners aren't a source of income. Because they generally, I mean, other than like the big miners like Rio Tinto and BHP Group, that you know, the big miners that pay four, five, six, seven percent dividends, gold miners don't, silver miners don't, they pay one percent, one, maybe two percent, right? So they're not a source of income. Um, then you have to maybe go into covered call strategies like a stock like um, GGN, the Gamco Global Gold and Natural Resources Trust that runs a covered call strategy on gold and oil to produce nine percent every month, things like that. You got to get into the midstream. Of these markets, right? So you got to get into integrated oil majors if you think oil is in a bull market, which I do, or pipeline comp- back into pipeline companies with that have good balance sheets and good cap tables, and then you'll see pipeline MLPs will be throwing off 10, 11 percent again. This will be the time to to buy those, especially after they've gone through a correct a correction and a contraction. Um, you always want to buy. Um, pipeline. I may, I've made this mistake many times in the past. You want to buy pipeline MLPs when no one wants them, okay? And they're going through restructuring, and they're because they're so financially con- constrained because of the, the tax structure that they invariably wind up having to um, uh, uh, dilute shareholders in order to, you know, recapitalize the company and then grow. And then once the commodity cycle works in their favor, then all of a sudden they start throwing off amazing amounts of free cash flow for a couple of years. And they're, you know, they're doubling and throwing off 16%, but they only do that for so long. Then they get over levered and then then the whole thing collapses again. Um, In this market, that's where you want to, you want to be thinking in those terms. So, you know, is it, where are, where's the energy market underserved? Everybody's been, you know, over the moon about AI and EVs. Well, I got news for you. 
I don't know about anybody else, but my people have been screaming at me to buy coal stocks. Go look at the price of coal stocks around the world. They're trading at PDEs of two and three. If their foreign companies are trading at price to sales of less than one, throwing off anywhere from a six to 11% dividend. Why? And then, oh, by the way, we're, used, we're powering all these EVs with coal anyway. Like, it's insane. So I think, you know, uranium has probably had a good run at this point. The coal is trading, you know, it is, is, isn't even trading at anything close to, it's barely trading at, at close to like a, a long-term breakout from consolidation. So, I mean, these are the places you want to look, right? Railroad companies or transport, midstream stuff is what's going to make money in the, in the, um, uh, in a, in a, in a stagflationary environment. Uh, and then, you know, possibly even, you know, fundamental land REITs like timberland, uh, farmland, stuff, stuff like that. Not commercial REITs, right? Not residential REITs. That's all, that's all dead. But stuff that's not based on credit, but it's based on actually building stuff and producing stuff that people need. Because people are going to shift from pie in the sky, credit, you know, fuel dreams of, of, of wine and cheese to, um, you know, rice and beans and, and, you know, do I have enough, you know, I can't afford to put, um, gasoline in my car. So, you know, now what do we do? Oh, I still have to get to work every day. So under those, in, in, in that environment, I'm not, and I'm also not crazy about consumer, def- the classic kind of consumer defensives in this position, um, because I think their costs are going to be insane. Um, my go-to stock in something like that would be something like Nestle. When Nestle trade at a greater than 3% yield, Nestle is a buy because it's a very well-run company. Whether you like whether you like the politics or anything else, they're a very well-run company. I know it very well. And the best way to buy Nestle is when it's trading above 3% on the yield. And then you'll get 3% yield and usually a little bit of price appreciation and it'll return you 5 to 6%. That's what they, they're, they're very good at it. But don't, but don't buy it if it's less than 3% yield. All right. It's a lot of, uh, a lot of good insights there. But Tom, be, before we head out, can you tell the people how they can follow more of your views and your work? Sure. You can follow me in basically three places. We'll start with Twitter, where the very worst version of me will show up every day uh, at TFL1728. And I mean that sincerely. It's, it's, it's definitely the hyper stylized version of me. Um, it's the one where I let everything loose. I let all my, what little hair I have left, I let it all down. Um, you can follow me at my blog at tomluongo.me or goldgoatsandguns.com. And you can also follow, and you can also sign up at the Patreon at patreon slash goldgoatsandguns. Um, we have two tiers. Uh, one is the retail, uh, investor newsletter where you get everything, including the newsletter with a portfolio, uh, a model portfolio for, and, and whatnot, along with, I do, um, private, uh, podcasts twice a week on Wednesdays and Sundays, what I call the market reports where I go over, um, news of the day, plus all the, uh, a technical read on all the structural markets, along with bespoke chart reads for the patrons and whatnot, along with private, po- uh, pri- private, uh, podcasts and, uh, and blog posts as well. So all of my first thoughts go to my patrons first, and then everything kind of leaks out into the, into the public. All right. Uh, Tom Luongo, I, I appreciate the, the time you've given. Um, I'd like to get you back on soon. And I think, you know, maybe the next time I'll just have maybe one or two topics and, and take a deeper dive into it. Um, I think we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it that way, but I do appreciate the time and, and I really do hope we can do this again soon. Absolutely, Patrick. I enjoyed myself. You have a great afternoon and we'll, uh, or day, I know you're on the, I think you might be on the other side of the world, but uh, yeah, um, you have a great day and we'll talk soon. That was Tom Luongo sharing his views on the economy and more. To see more of Tom's insights, please visit his Gold, Goats, and Guns website at tomluongo.me. If you like this video, please do subscribe, share it, and give us a thumbs up. All are greatly appreciated. Audio-only versions of this interview can be found on iTunes and Spotify.